thank you to everyone for joining. I'm really pleased to be part of such an international and diverse and, and wonderful um, panel of scholars. So let's share screen. Um, so I am going to bring an institutional perspective to this discussion. Uh, so my presentation and kind of what I'm sharing today is based on part of my thesis, uh, which I submitted last year. And I was looking at how the Auschwitz-Birkenau State Museum has adapted to the digital museum, by which I mean kind of uh, public facing digital elements. So I did touch on some of this at a discussion we had last year, in fact. So apologies if there's, there's some repetition um, if you were there a year ago. But today, obviously, I'm going to focus on the social media aspect of, um, of the Auschwitz Museum. And I chose it as my case study because it's, you know, by far, for want of a better word, perhaps the most prominent um, former Nazi camp, certainly Holocaust Museum on social media. Uh, and also, I would say the most, one of the most, but probably the most interactive um, and active um, Holocaust Museum on social media. Um, let me see. If that will there we go so um when the when the museum launched a facebook site in 2009 it actually made the news and this was on bbc news that you know this holocaust museum had come to social media which was by then or at that point kind of relatively <coughs> or kind of more in its infancy um than it is now um and it was an experiment so i've spoken lots with um or oh, i think sorry sorry someone's got their microphone on if you could just mute that because I can kind of hear myself coming back and we'll there we go thank you <laughs> um yes so anyway sorry um so the museum launched this as an experiment to see how people would engage to see what people thought and in fact they did get feedback from Facebook users to decide whether or not they should continue and the response was overwhelmingly positive they amassed 8,000 followers within the space of a couple of days and carried on from there and then of course with the launch of other social media such as Instagram and Twitter they set up sites there in 2012 um, and now have a combined following of um, a million and a half different um, accounts. So this is just a kind of overview really of the type of content that's shared. It's interesting that for such a large and well-known museum, there isn't a kind of explicit strategy in terms of content. It's very much a one-man operation. Um, so Pavel Savitsky, who again has been on uh, involved in one of the digital Holocaust memory discussions last year, is um, predominantly the person who is in charge of, of curating, if you like, the content um, for the museum social media. And there are some differences between the three main platforms which I looked at. So first of all, Facebook, there isn't so much of a, a word limit, a word count. So there's longer, more detailed information that's shared, primarily historical, but also, you know, relating uh, news relating to the museum and so on. Um, on Instagram, they generally tend to share visitors photographs, ones that have already been shared on Instagram. So perhaps a kind of resharing. More recently, um, they've been sort of putting up photographs from their own archives and such because of the the absence of visitors um, because the museum, of course, had been shut most of last year and for a significant portion of this year so far because of the pandemic. And then for Twitter, which is what I'll look at mostly here, um, the sort of primary investigation in my thesis as well, um, because Twitter is much more varied, it's what Savitsky describes as the kind of the interactive hub for the museum in terms of um, the public, in terms of their followers. And they have lots and lots of different functionalities um, for content. So this is an example where they share the, the birthdays of both victims and survivors, primarily victims, um, people in their archives. So you can see this one is actually from this morning. Um, I'm uh, May. late after supper here because I don't want to travel Russia. Okay, well, that's good to know. Thank you. Um, so, uh, so um, we, uh, yeah, so we can see here that they've sort of shared um, information on a, on a victim. Uh, they share the information that they have. So sometimes it's an occupation, sometimes it's just a, a birth date, um, where they're from, and if they know the dates, as they say here, of where the person perished, um, then they will also include that. So this is something that um, a, a journalist called Alison Kaplan Sommer has termed faces, facts, documents and stories. So this is the kind of the overview, if you like, of, of what's put on there. When I completed my thesis, I looked at this 
adaptation to the digital and kind of three overarching themes. So authenticity, uh, audience and authority, which I will come on to shortly. And each of these essentially signals a bit of a dichotomy. Um, the Auschwitz Museum's practice and adaptation to the digital museum is a very good example of this dichotomy between trying to retain 20th century traditional didactic museum practice and then trying to adapt to new 21st century digital discourse. Okay, so obviously it's quite uh, an old museum in the sense that um, there has been a, a museum memorial on site since 1947 uh, when it was officially opened. So how to kind of bring the two together. So firstly, for authenticity, the museum always describes itself as an authentic site, rightly so. And it talks about kind of two authenticities, one being the authenticity of the memorial itself and the sites and the kind of authentic objects and buildings there. Um, and also the authenticity of the survivors and their testimonies. And when I was looking at the digital museum and thinking about how visitors interact with this, I, I landed on two slightly different types of authenticity. All of it's valid. And I think authenticity is such a complicated and nuanced term that it can be interpreted in different ways. So the way that I looked at it was to focus firstly on curatorial authenticity, which is to say the kind of more scientific, historic understanding of authentic. So objects that are of the time, are original, have had scientific tests conducted on them to prove that they are you know, what, what they appear to be. Um, and so obviously to translate that into social media and the digital is, is quite a challenge. Um, so we have, for example, here, this example of, uh, of taking people to a specific site, a uh, specific place on site. So there was a video shared last year of some of the prosthesis that are on display in the museum. Um, and this was again, when the museum was closed because of the pandemic and you can see they have said how many people have managed to watch this video which far outweighs the number of visitors they would have had at that particular point um so i see their social media particularly facebook and, and twitter really as a almost a rolling exhibition you know there's lots that doesn't get included in um the museum's uh, display panels also within the tour guiding because of time and space and so on so it's an opportunity for these new um documents and photographs and things to be shown on a kind of rolling basis and of course there's no real way of duplicating the experiential authenticity which is the second type um, that i cover in my thesis which is to say the authenticity that is felt by visitors so people don't necessarily comment on things being original or historic although they may do it's more about the feeling of being there and that's um you know that that feeling that is authentic to that person and their experiences and that is in fact something that is i wrote my blog about for for vicky so that's kind of the first way they use social media the second is um it's sort of maybe slightly less prevalent um, in this case is audience. So you can see here an example of some of the breakdown of the museum's audience um, from a couple of years ago. And they in fact have set up a separate Polish language account because the number of English language speakers has grown so exponentially um, on Twitter. And the museum has a very difficult balancing act to, to try and orchestrate. So on the one hand, they try and appeal to a, a whole one universal audience, but then within that inevitably there are audiences um, because you know you have variation in pre-existing knowledge, in age, in nationality and culture and so on. Um, so it is about trying to cater and make this information accessible to all age groups and all audience groups as well. The other thing that I will comment on briefly is the fact that um, although there is a kind of addressing as much as possible of a universal audience, the museum does sometimes address specific groups or specific audiences within that. So, for example, you may have seen if you follow them on Twitter, um, if a journalist kind of makes a, a mistake in an article, this will be corrected quite quickly and sort of publicly brought out to say, actually, could you change this phrase? Um, there have been kind of there was a spat last year with um, the author John Boyne, author of The Boy in the Striped Pajamas. Uh, he tweeted something about his book and the museum quickly responded to say basically that we don't um, advocate this book as any kind of tool in teaching people about the Holocaust. Um, so you can see within that there's still these kind of groups that are addressed um, and sometimes challenged as well on social media. 
And then the final category, as I say, is um, is authority. And this is something that Vicky had posed as one of the questions to think about for this discussion. And I just wanted to show these two examples because they seem the content of them seems similar in some ways, but the reaction was very different. So on the left hand side, we have what Vicky showed um, at the beginning of the session, which is this rubber duck that someone took to Birkenau. Clearly, you know, they visit lots of places and landmarks and they take a picture at these different sites and Birkenau happened to be one of them. So they put this out as a question to their Twitter followers. You know, is this something that we should just accept or is this something actually we should challenge? And they left followers to debate it amongst themselves. People, you know, some people agreeing, some people disagreeing. And it wasn't a, a kind of curated space. It was just, OK, you know, let people have their opinions on this. On the other hand, before that, in fact, uh, they had asked people not to balance, as you can see in this way, and sort of pose for photographs on the railway tracks, which obviously is understandably, um, you know, it's, it's not a, an unreasonable request, you know, in terms of visitor behaviour. But this wasn't up for discussion in the same way. So people did comment and say, well, you know, perhaps we can interpret this as an affirmation of life or, you know, something more positive, or maybe it's, there's still education in here rather than just criticism. And at this point, the museum did step in and actually say, no, no, this is not acceptable. This is not up for discussion. Basically, um, you know, this goes against the kind of regulations of respect that we would expect from our visitors. And as I say, this is not too discredit the museum or, or Savitsky um, and the way it's run, but it shows this really interesting dichotomy between different levels of authority, when this is relaxed and when this isn't relaxed. Um, the museum uses something online which Peter Walsh calls the unassailable voice. So this is a kind of tone and attitude that museums often uh, put forward when they present information to visitors. Um, you know, and this is something that is prevalent on site. So you have the tour guide there is some opportunity for questions, but generally it's quite fast paced. It's quite information heavy and the displays, you know, there's no real opportunity in most tours to, to kind of stop and reflect and, and pause. So it's very much information that comes from one direction. And you can see this still um, on the, the sort of the way that the museum uses social media. And one thing I'd like to, to end with just to kind of slightly go off on a not not quite a tangent but something that is relates related to social media um and this is something that i'm starting to look at more um kind of post thesis is a trip advisor and this so i've looked at kind of you know much more institutional perspective and in fact in the news just last week um it had uh, become apparent that someone had entered a a kind of an inappropriate trolling review of the Auschwitz Museum on TripAdvisor uh, and the algorithm. This is something that my other panelists will understand much more than me. Um, but the algorithms had kind of looked at this when it was when there was a complaint lodged and said, you know, we, there's nothing in this that violates our community guidelines. And then, of course, the museum used Twitter and its audience to to highlight this. And then TripAdvisor took the, the review down and apologized. But actually, it kind of leads into going from institutional to the kind of the more bottom up um, perspective. And I think TripAdvisor as a, as a social network, it kind of markets itself as a social travel network, is a really interesting and underused resource for looking at um, visitors kind of expectations of former sites. I know I saw um, Timothy Williams in the audience who's done a little bit of work, I understand, on, on kind of TripAdvisor and, and transnational memory and sort of remembrance on TripAdvisor. Um, and I've looked before a little bit about negative reviews. So these are some of the examples I've put here, um, which you know can, can kind of be categorized very loosely into um, you know, one star for the fact that you know the, the, the nature of the place itself and what it involves and its symbolism. Um, the second one is more about criticism of others, of their behavior, of the fact that the Auschwitz Museum is, is kind of a bucket list tourist destination. Um, and then the other, the, the last one, sorry, is more. Um, speaks more to visitor expectations. And in fact, this is something I've seen on other um, former Nazi camp reviews, particularly for some reason Dachau, the, the use of the word sanitize, which is used here as well. Um, this, ex this idea that the camps have kind of been cleaned up in preparation for, for visitors to, to come and have a look. And, and that really begs the question of what visitors are expecting. But also the whole, um, the kind of structure of TripAdvisor and the fact that you can get three completely different reviews for this kind of one star or one dot process um, speaks a lot of uh, about how some of these sites are not necessarily engineered towards, you know, 
looking at sites that are commemorating uh, the Holocaust, genocide, dark tourism, and so on. So I hope you'll excuse my, my slight kind of um, sidetrack into that, but that was just kind of an overview of, of the research that I've done so far. Um, and yes, I'd be very interested to, to hear questions and feedback. Thank you.